When I asked him what silence was, he said, it is the tomb of Christ. It is the place of infinite possibility. So in that way, right, loving silence is place of, of resurrection, a place of holding us, a place of moving us beyond and awakening. On In Good Faith, we believe that all faith traditions have something to teach us about how God is working in the world and in our lives. So join us as we listen and learn. Today on In Good Faith, I'm excited to ask a question that's crossed my mind. Well, sort of. Senior producer Heather Bigley, have you ever wanted to be a nun? I, it's such a hard question, Steve. <laughs> when I was younger, I wanted to run away in so many different ways from my home. Uh, one of them was boarding school, and one of them was like, oh, what's this nun thing that I could look at, you know? Uh, so maybe? How about that? Yeah. I think we've all wondered what it would be like to, even when I read about Jesus in the New Testament, 40 days in the desert, what right. does one, some people, and that used to be me, panic at the thought of silence right? Uh, because we're thinking boredom. But there's this whole other thing that we're going to learn about today with Cassidy Hall, who's just fascinating. I don't want to give it away, but she has this marvelous story of basically her life in an instant changing when work got too stressful and she happened to be reading a book by a monk. And she wants to go explore, right? <laughs> and in a way that we don't we might not think of as exploring, right? Yeah. And she she talks about that tension, like going to a place where you're silent all the time and there's all these rigid rules, and yet she found freedom. Yeah. Cassidy is an author, an award winning filmmaker, a podcaster, and a leading voice in contemplative spirituality. Her films are In Pursuit of Silence and Day of a Stranger, and she's the co-host of the Encountering Silence podcast and creator of the Contemplating Now and Queering Contemplation podcast. So I don't know if you ever wanted to go on a coast-to-coast -to -coast tour of monasteries. <laughs> It sounds lovely, and I, and from what I know, Steve, you're you're starting your journey next May. So I I am going to go to a one of these silent retreats for four days, and you will hear why. As I start by asking Cassidy, what on earth were you thinking? To this day, every time I tell this story, it does seem shocking and strange, but. Also to this day, it is the thing that has made perfect sense to my spiritual journey. I like to say, and I, and I know and I feel in my heart that spiritual life is alive and awakened to its greatest possibility in those moments of paradox when things don't make sense. And what happened for me is in 2011, I was working as a drug and alcohol counselor in Iowa, which is my, my home state. And in between clients, I was getting progressively just burnt out and overworked, underpaid. I was new to the field of counseling and I was working for a community agency. So I was getting a lot of court ordered situations and, and things like that. And I loved the work with the clients. It was more the problem of being overworked in that type of a system. But what happened for me is one day in the midst of being overwhelmed with paperwork and overwhelmed with my caseload, I had a panic attack. And what really shifted for me that day was recognizing, okay, something needs to change, but what is it? And at the time, I was reading Thomas Merton's book called New Seeds of Contemplation. And I was literally picking up this book in between client sessions for five minutes here, 10 minutes there, and just reading and reading and falling in love with these words. And, you know, interestingly enough, Steve, at the time, I didn't even know how to pronounce contemplation or contemplative or any of these words. And, and that's one thing that's so important to me on this journey is that I want to point to the ways that contemplation is so accessible for everyone. It's not about saying the word right. It's about taking that sacred pause to look out the window. And I was just in love with what Thomas Merton was writing. So I looked up where he lived and he was a monk who lived at the Abbey Gethsemane in Kentucky, and he died in 1968. And that day I decided, you know what? I need to go see where this guy lived, where he wrote these words. So on my next long weekend that I could take off, I traveled to Kentucky. 
And I did a overnight retreat there for the weekend and just fell in love with the silence and the solitude and the rhythm of, of monasteries. And that trip, as I was leaving, going back to my work, I noticed on the wall there was a map that pointed to all 17 Trappist monasteries in the United States. Just kind of took note of that, went back to my work, went back to my high anxiety, and eventually said, I think I got to go to all these places. I started looking up monasteries and emailing them and asking if I could come stay for a retreat. And it worked out in such a way where I could travel by car to all these locations kind of in, a, in an order that made sense for driving. So I put in my 30-day notice at my job and I spent my savings to travel to these monasteries, not knowing why. All I knew was that the silence and the solitude was something that felt good and right and important for that time in my life. And at each of those locations, I met with monks or nuns to talk about contemplative life and ask them about silence and solitude. Another aspect of this that's pretty important is that I'm not Catholic. I have no Catholic background. So my family kind of wondered, well, are you going to be a nun? No, that's not the point of this. But yes, it was a strange journey that ultimately led me to numerous things, but allowed me to kind of emerge in my own spiritual life. Your book is called Queering Contemplation. And for a lot of folks, they'll hear queerness as a definition of sexuality or orientation. But you are expanding that into really anything that's maybe, what? Would, how would you call that? Something different than the norm? For me, the way I see queer is not only related to my sexuality, but it's the way I tilt my head to look at the world. What those two things coming together mean to me is to see beyond boxes and categories, to see through binaries. And I think queering something can invite us into not just seeing things differently, but also allowing us to see beyond what is for what could be. Well, you dedicate the book. The first thing I noticed was dedicated to the queerness in all of us, meaning that thing that is maybe different than other people that maybe sometimes we feel we have to hide, but maybe it's the thing that is the gift we have, a way of seeing things. That's right. Yeah. In the book, I really work with the word queer as a word of oddness and strangeness and weirdness. And as you're saying, in these positive ways, right? What are those things about us? that are unique about us that we often don't reveal or don't become in our own lifetime. I wonder if I could have you read from 151 in the book. This is the whole idea of what contemplation is. Yeah. When we let go of the contemplative status quo, there are more voices to listen to, more experiences to learn from, and more life experiences to understand. When we queer the things we once thought stagnant, like the monastery or rituals, we can bring to experience the possibilities in practice and encounter. When we queer silence, we can fall into its loving embrace while fighting against its opposing toxicity. When we acknowledge the innate queerness of mysticism and the liminal, we can engage our imagination and eroticism more deeply. When we embrace the queerness of attention and even boredom, we can center ourselves more deeply in the isness and the enoughness of the present moment. When we queer the deserts of our lives, we can rid ourselves of the parts no longer necessary for the journey ahead and stretch our roots of interconnection. So let me describe a moment that I had and ask you about it. I had chosen to go to the Oregon coast, which is my favorite place on earth. It's the best coast. It is the best <laughs> coastline. Yes. So I was at Rockaway Beach, which is not the most famous place, but it's lovely. And that particular crisp, sunny October day, I walked out on the beach and I was seeing this rock that has an arch in it, twin rocks out in the water. And there was this mist that was coming in with the sunlight. And I remember for about two minutes thinking, I'm actually not sure if I'm in a painting or if this is my real life. Yeah. Yeah. And those moments, you know, the best part about those moments is that they're really inexplicable. I mean, you try to tell that story to somebody and they don't fully get it or feel it because 
that moment was just for you. That moment was something that they might experience in a totally different way. All of us can relate to at least one moment in our lives where we've had such deep childlike awe or wonder, whether it's a butterfly or the ocean or a tree or a moment of such great pause that we get to this place of kind of bafflement. We get to this place of deep awe where we kind of just release and let go. And sometimes it gives us the giggles, but <laughs> I've found that those, <laughs> those are the moments that really deepen what is present and deepen what is true. And if I know anything of God, if I know anything of the divine, that is it for me. Yeah. Well, now that we've learned how to say contemplative or contemplative, whichever we prefer, <laughs> You yeah. bring up some categories about silence, contemplative silence, toxic silence, and loving silence. What is toxic silence and loving silence? My experience of toxic silence is harmful and even violence. Things like the silent treatment we give our beloved. Mm. For me, it was the ways I was hidden in a relationship, an early relationship in my life. Toxic silence is the kind of silence that leads us to not speak up at the exact moment when something matters. Toxic silence also shows up on a larger scale in terms of politics by not helping the hungry, the hurt, or the marginalized. On the other hand, contemplative silence is a place of discernment and it teaches us when to speak. Therese Taylor Stinson, she has one of my most favorite definitions of contemplation. And she talks about contemplation's wholeness relies on both inward solitude and reflection and an outward response to what we find ourselves present and awake to. In this way, to me, contemplative silence is innately tethered to action. And loving silence is boundless. A monk once told me, when I was going around and asking these monks and nuns, you know, what does silence mean to you? What's solitude? What are all these things? When I asked him what silence was, he said, it is the tomb of Christ. It is the place of infinite possibility. So in that way, right, loving silence is places of resurrection, a place of holding us, a place of moving us beyond and awakening. It's really necessary to know toxic silence and to see and understand toxic silence in order to meet and understand the loving and contemplative silence that's generative, that's creative, whereas toxic silence is destructive. I'm wondering about the inner toxic silence. It seems like there must be a thing where we can't quite bring ourselves to admit something that's true. And you say, the first companion I'd been waiting for, after all, was myself. The first voice I'd been needing to hear, it turns out, was mine. Is that a mystery to people, that whole idea that do we actually know ourselves and do we dare listen to ourselves? What's your personal experience with that? For me, one of the really important aspects of my journey to understand myself as a queer woman was meeting myself in that place and knowing myself and who I am. And in order to, to come out and to be alive in my sexuality in the world, and I was lucky enough to grow up in a family where there was no need for a coming out process. And I was blessed to be comfortable and allowed to be who I am very easily. Not everyone has that. But yes, the importance of meeting myself in the silence and finding out who I was, was a necessary part for me to step forward in wholeness. And, and really the ways in which I came to know myself and my own continual becoming allowed me to to see contemplation and contemplative life as a more whole spiritual experience because it's been often just tethered to voices that have been so much unlike my own. So this is really intriguing to me that you have chosen to go to these monasteries because they are places of silence and contemplation. You're also entering a place that doctrinally does not support part of who you feel you are at your core. Was there yeah. a tension there? Or it seems from your book like you found a lot of really understanding people to speak with. I didn't come up upon any difficulties or problems in being who I was in those spaces. I'm not saying that that would feel the same to every queer or LGBTQIA plus person. 
that might just feel that way for me based on my own history and experience. And so I'm not saying that that's a safe experience for everyone. For me, it felt incredibly safe, incredibly freeing, incredibly enlivening for my whole self. You know, it's ironic because these places of seeming boundaries and hindrances, the ways they, they pray seven times a day, the ways they take a vow of stability to place, all these kinds of things are really antithetical to queerness in the ways that they seem more of like being boxed in as opposed to being freed. There's a story in the book that I talk about where I talked with a monk at this abbey in South Carolina. I just said, why have you chosen to stay here? What's the deal? Why, <laughs> why are you still here? I could make sense of it spiritually, but I couldn't quite make sense of it beyond that. And he told me just one of those stories of awe, just like your story on the Oregon coast. He said, you know, Cassidy, one time I went out for a walk and I was discerning whether or not to leave or stay. I was discerning whether or not to get married or to go find a different job. On that walk, I saw a deer and we looked each other in the eyes and I knew I needed to stay. And he just turned around and went back and stayed. And that story really moved and changed me because every time I walked into a monastery, I couldn't figure out why I felt such freedom. You know, I was surrounded by this structure and schedule and bells and expectation, but there was something accessible there that I hadn't yet reached. The monastery taught me that when I make commitments in my life to place, to a person, to a value, there's something I cannot otherwise access without that commitment. In our society, we often view commitments as limiting, but I learned in these spaces that it actually opens me up onto something I couldn't otherwise access. And it seems like, could that commitment even be to a person? Absolutely, yes. Because that yeah, definitely I mean, limits your freedom. That's right, yeah. The ways I view, view the beauty of something like marriage is that that actually opens one up to a depth that could not otherwise be reached because that choice, that commitment, brings out deeper possibilities. In the book, I, I also talk about my choice to remain Christian. And I, perhaps not ironically, name a Buddhist quote that says, better to dig one well 60 feet deep than six wells 10 feet deep. So Christianity being kind of the well I was born into and have chosen, I stick with that to go deep. Not because I can't access the water from elsewhere, another faith, or even a non-faith, but the fact that that's the well I'm in, that's the one I'm digging, and I want to stick with that and stay there. You're listening to In Good Faith. We're speaking with author, filmmaker, and podcaster Cassidy Hall. Back with more in a moment. Hi, this is Stephen Cap Perry, and I'd love to recommend one of our BYU Radio family of podcasts for you. It's called The Appleseed. It's filled with stories for you and your family. Every episode features really excellent nationally known storytellers sharing all kinds of folk tales, fairy tales, personal and family stories. It's great to put on and listen to for road trips or bedtime for kids or anytime you want something to get the whole family not only listening, but then those stories generate conversations. And it's so easy to say, hey, do you have a story about this? Or, oh, that reminds me of when grandma said, or whatever it might be. Check out the Appleseed podcast. You'll have fun, and you might learn some new stories from your own family members. Welcome back to In Good Faith. We'll continue our conversation with Cassidy Hall, author of Queering Contemplation. On the personal side, was this journey an answer to prayer? Or maybe was it an answer to a prayer you hadn't even known to pray yet? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. I think it was definitely a new experience for me. And I think a huge, huge part of my spiritual journey has been about trusting myself, trusting my inner wisdom, and in turn, the ways that for me has meant this larger trusting of God. It seems the more that I've leaned into my true self, my own becoming and growth and evolution, not only the more I get to see of God, the, but the more I feel 
led by the divine, the more synchronicities and those kinds of things. Boy, you're making me wonder now, can I really know God if I don't know my true self? Because I think that true self is the actual creation, the part of me that comes from divinity. I just want to say yes. I mean, I think I think the beauty of the true self is that it's always happening, right? Like we're we're creatures that are always quite literally growing. We're all aging. We're all moving and becoming. And so I think the gift of that is that in turn, we get to keep seeing that alongside the divine. And I, I think that we never fully come to know ourselves because it continues to happen throughout our lives. I once thought, sort of like an onion, if I start peeling away the layers, I thought, what is really me and what is my collection of experiences? And so I say, okay, well, I was born in this place. If I were to peel that, can I even peel that away? If I hadn't you know, studied this in school, can I peel that away? If I hadn't met so-and-so, is there something that is just that came with me as me? And I was a little worried that if I peeled away enough layers, nothing would be there. And so when I hear yeah. true self, I think, I was a little worried about the true self. I thought, am I just a, a conglomeration of my experiences and the people I know and where I've been and what's happened to me? Or is there this core thing? I think there is, but I'm wondering what you think. Yeah, I absolutely think that there is a, a core aspect in all of us that is of the divine and of ourselves. And it's kind of that that deepest enmeshment and entanglement that we have with God in our in our heart of hearts. And I think it often feels inaccessible to us or far from us because we cover our identities with titles or with our jobs or with our relational titles, sister, friend, those kinds of things. One of the things that I've come to learn about about my true self is that it's it's often the most inaccessible at times because it's the most raw and vulnerable part of who I am. It's the part that makes me cry all the time <laughs> that when I when I'm really fully feeling and really fully intuitively engaged with with who I am and and who I am in the grand scheme of of life. I, I, I love the heading you did breaking up with Thomas Merton. Because, you know, how do you break up with someone who was dead in 1968? But you've had a relationship as with other teachers. That was an entree into contemplative practice. But then you talk about breaking up. Yeah. So I had been reading Thomas Merton for some time since 2011. In 2018, I was at a peace conference in Toronto, Canada with Jim Forrest and one day I went for a walk in the rain and I went to a bookstore and, you know, browse around. I was looking in the bookshelf at Thomas Merton books. I found a book of letters and I was looking for Jim Forrest's name in the back because I was at this peace conference with him and Jim and Thomas Merton corresponded. And instead of seeing Jim's name in the back of the book, I saw the word homosexuality. And I thought to myself, homosexuality, Thomas Merton never wrote about that. What is this? So I flipped to the page and it's Thomas Merton writing about, he's writing a letter to an unknown friend is how it's titled. And he says something to the effect of homosexuality is not a greater offense than any other sin. Maybe psychiatric help would be of use. So this was hard to see because Merton was a hero to me, right? And so naturally this was hurtful. And so I kind of went on my way and carried on. And that was a big, big turning point for me about Merton kind of being a hero in my life. And, and so I do think it's really important that we need new heroes. We need heroes that speak to our lives, that speak to our times and these moments. And though I came to the contemplative life through Merton, I came to realize there were so many things that Merton just couldn't speak to that either I was experiencing or seeing in the world or that others were. And so many marginalized experiences where contemplative life was calling for more action. What's also important to me is that I believe that Merton would be fully on board with engaging with more marginalized voices and more voices that are unlike his own. Because if you look at his vast list of correspondences, he held dear 
uh, having interfaith correspondences, having correspondences with folks from different identities and backgrounds. He corresponded with Dorothy Day, Rachel Carson. It's said that he wrote a letter to James Baldwin, but I don't know if he never got it or what happened there. Abraham Heschel, D.T. Suzuki. He was a very expansive and curious person. And so I think that it's actually honoring of his legacy to really expand the reach of who our heroes ought to be in the contemplative world. That was Cassidy Hall, who had quite an adventure, literally going state to state, 17 different Trappist abbeys or monasteries. She talks about silence in an interesting way. We heard about toxic silence and loving silence and that they can be very different things. That was educational to me. Well, and I just love that thought from the monk that she talked to that silence is Christ's tomb. Mm. Uh, And I just imagine being there in the tomb with the body of Christ or even better, being in that tomb and it's empty, Mm. right? And thinking what happened and what will happen next. Like, that moves me. And so this idea that contemplation would bring us to this place where we can witness the divinity of Christ and that we can then contemplate what that means for our lives, uh, that makes it more accessible for me. And helps maybe in the pursuit of the question that she talks about, what is your true self? Which, as you heard, I was peeling my onion back, (laughs) because I was afraid to peel too much in case it was just empty. Right. But, uh, but, but she, she found that. Yeah. Well, and I think this is a great conversation. I recently had this conversation at church. Who are we really? What? Who are our true selves? And a lot of us settled on, well, we're children of God, but, but that is both a role and an identity, right? Mm. Like, to me, there's still this tension in there of like, well, what does that really mean? Who I am? What gifts have I been given? Yeah, because if we we could say I am a child of God about. Every human being. Right. So, what is is there at the core? No individuality. We, I'm of the opinion that that's impossible. Right. And she also talks about this idea of like we often hide between titles and roles. And I agree with her. We often say to ourselves, "Well, I'm say I'm a mother, um, and that's going to define who I am for now." But I also think that in being a mother or in being a sister you actually learn all kinds of lessons. You often shape and develop the gifts that you were given. So those are roles, but those are also places where we become fully more ourselves. So the true us isn't necessarily some static thing. Like I'm thinking now because of what you just said <laughs> by the end of my life, my true self has has changed slightly or should. Right. This episode was produced by Heather Bigley. Our production team also includes Leah King, Katarina Martinez, Josh Orton, and Ashton Rowan. Our post-production sound designers are Mark Hansen, Brandon Lewis, Daniel Phillips, and Carly Wilson. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. If interfaith understanding is important to you, be sure and leave a comment or review where you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple, wherever. Find us on Twitter or X, In Good Faith Pod, on Instagram and Facebook, In Good Faith Podcast. We have a YouTube channel too, youtube.com slash at in-good-faith. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you join me again soon right here in good faith. (laughs) 